cogent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires, welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters, and I am ridiculously excited to have my very good friend, Joe Sanek, on the show. He runs Practice of the Practice. He teaches different therapists and psychotherapists how to actually grow, well, start and grow their practice. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Jamie, I am so excited to be here. Well, we were giggling, or I was giggling. You were probably laughing like a man before. <laughs> before yes. I can giggle. Right? I have two daughters. <laughs> I'm um, prone to giggling once in a while. Because <laughs> we have been friends for such a such a long time, so it's so amazing to have you on the show. Explain to everybody what exactly practice of the practice does. Yeah, so we help healthcare professionals, mostly counselors in private practice, chiropractors, massage therapists, to start, grow, and scale their private practices with really innovative ideas. So things that we typically don't learn in grad school. So, and that's the funny thing, no offense, but I, when you when you look at the service professional side, the, what they're learning on the skill set side is amazing. What they're learning on the business side, like literally people will come to me and be like, oh, I'm supposed to get my business cards and hand them out at networking events. And I'm supposed to, right? And that's sort of the old school way. Don't get me wrong, that stuff can actually work too, but you go over a lot more ideas. So what do you say innovative, quote unquote, is? Yeah, I think you know, a lot of those traditional ways still really work in the private practice space. People are going to refer to those that they know, like, and trust. And so if people don't know that you exist, uh, then obviously they're probably not going to refer to you. Uh, but there's so much just low-hanging fruit out there for anyone that's at the start, grow, or scale phase. And so one thing at the very beginning that you want to look at is just the basic SEO of your website. And so people will have a counseling website, and it looks like it's from the late 90s. It has clip art. And this is like 90% of the websites. And there is no reason to have an ugly website these days. There's great companies that specialize in helping therapists. Uh, there's really easy platforms to learn. And so even just doing a little bit of blogging, a little bit of SEO work to rank higher in Google, you can right away be in the top 10%. Okay. So what, who is this for though? Because I also hear people come back. The reason why they have the clip art website is because they don't get tech. They're like, I don't know if people are finding me online or not. So is this only meant for people that really do want to grow online marketing or just in, they need to get over the tech side if they don't know how to do that? Yeah. So with Practice the Practice, we really just focus on everything business in regards to having a private practice. And so we're looking at the marketing online and offline. We're looking at the technology. We're looking at automating systems. When do you hire a virtual assistant? How do you optimize your time? But really, when we kind of zoom out, what are we teaching is first, we want to have a certain lifestyle. We want to say, OK, what's the life I want to live for my, my kids, for my long term goals. Uh, so many times we see practitioners that they go full tilt and then they burn out and they really could have had another 20 years of serving their community uh, or they could have hired a bunch of clinicians to join and serve their community from kind of their point of view, but then they don't because they burn out. And so we start with their lifestyle and then we fit their practice and their big ideas into that. And so the practice side, we want to look at, are you optimizing your practice, doing only the things that you should be doing and then on the big idea side, what are the things that you know as a practitioner that the rest of the world needs to know? So I have one consulting client, for example, uh, she really helps people that are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. So a really big issue that a lot of people deal with. It affects their marriages. It affects their relationships with people. And she has a message that goes so much farther beyond just her individual work. And so she's working on creating some sort of e-platform that she can spread that message. And so those big ideas oftentimes help us replicate ourselves and scale beyond just our typical community. I love how you segment that too, because the business growth is ridiculously important in your life skill, like how you live your life, ridiculously important, but getting that idea out. So it's not just a hamster wheel, because especially in, in therapy, I, I just told you that I, I rented an office and all the therapists were there all the time. And I'm like, well, I coach on Tuesdays. So I'll be here on Tuesday, but they're here like nine to five, back to back to back to back. And I'm going, I forget, I forget that, you know, it's that long of a day when you're doing that constantly. So they don't even have the time to even think about the big idea, let alone all the rest of it. So how do you it, yeah. handle that? I mean, there's so much low hanging fruit with, with therapists. So for example, a typical therapist will be on most of the insurance panels in their area. Even just starting with, well, what's the worst insurance panel I, I'm on? Which one pays the least and doesn't pay me on time and they reject my bills and they're just a pain. 
Well, send them a letter and ask to either negotiate rates, which you can do, or just leave that insurance panel uh, and then move towards more private pay. And then you can choose your rates. You can choose your clientele. When we start to even just run some of those numbers, uh, it doesn't take very long to see that if you're at 25 or 30 clients on insurance, oftentimes you can have half of that uh, when, when you have a kind of typical private pay practice. The other angle that people might want to look at is maybe you still want to keep insurance because of your community or your mindset or whatever reason you decide that's best for you. If you've actually thought through it and said, yes, I still want to take insurance. Well, then we want to create systems to help you grow instead of just saying, I'm going to do my own billing. I'm going to answer the phones. Uh, instead, we want to look at other people and processes that can help you continue to scale so that you can leave for weeks on end and have your practice still make you money. Which everyone's like, wait, leave for weeks on end? <laughs> wait, what? Yes, huh? <laughs> please. Well, there are those little steps that um, need to be decided on uh, to take, like the private pay thing where people, and I, what I, let's, let's actually pick an avatar so that way we can walk through what you would suggest for them. Because what I hear back from the private pay is, oh, well, then I'm not going to get the, the people, the referrals, and then I'm going to have no money, and then I'm going to blah, 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 right? So let's say that there's somebody making maybe 50, 60,000 a year so not horrible but not like yay, lots of money and they feel like they have to be in there and they have to do the insurance what would you tell them for that low-hanging fruit besides okay get rid of the crappy insurance because that's definitely yeah so i would start with that fear of i'm not going to get referrals so let's just think through our own lives you're down in austin i'm in traverse city both foodie towns uh, if you go to a fancy French restaurant and say you take a friend that's just a meat and potatoes kind of guy and he's like, I just want a good burger at that French restaurant. If they chose to make your friend a burger, it's probably going to be a delicious burger. But if you go to a mom and pop diner and say, you know, I would dig some creme brulee, it is not going to be good. So the natural assumption is that a specialist can be a generalist. You know, if you talk to a brain surgeon about that, like itch on your shoulder or whatever, like they're going to say, OK, go get some cream or talk to your primary care doctor. But you're not going to talk to your primary care doctor about brain surgery. They're going to refer you out. So we always assume a specialist will be a generalist. And so when we specialize and say, I only do marriage therapy uh, or I help, you know, young teens that are transitioning or I work on these areas, I help people that are cutting or hurting themselves or women in transition, whatever your thing is, and you're known for that, you can charge more, um, but then you get more referrals. And people will make the assumption that, hey, Joe used to work with angry kids. You know what? I bet he can also work with anxious kids. I bet he can work with my angry husband. I bet he can work with all these other people. People make the assumption to work. So I would start with people want to know who they want to serve. So I'd start with a specialty. We hear that all over in business. You know, Christopher Lockhead's new book, Niche, Niche Down, uh, or any of those. You just got to know who you want to attract. And then I would say create different spokes out from that person. Who's influencing that person? Because people make decisions to go to therapy really in only two, two ways. A person or uh, some sort of organization will recommend them and give their blessing. So that could be a pastor, a doctor, an insurance company, friends or family members, or they just do a blind search. And that's where the kind of internet optimization comes in. They go on Google, they go on Yelp, they look around, they type in marriage counselor Austin, and then, you know, someone pops up and they're going to try to you know, reach out to them. And when uh, that's a specialty of mine, it's so insane to look, I have a client that's in that space in Virginia. And I was like, nobody's even optimizing for any of these keywords. That's like free money people. I mean, but if, seriously, yeah. like I had a, I had someone that they bought um, TexasSupervision.com for counselors doing supervision. And like, there's still so many websites that are just free. Like, I think we bought um, LLPC Supervision, which is our licensure for the state of Michigan. And then I ended up selling that arm of the company. And so like, you can acquire these websites you know, so cheap because therapists just aren't thinking this stuff. How do you pick though? So even if you're making some money as more of a generalist, it's the it's the whole well once I pick something I can't change like do they have to know what that big idea is that they want to submit their whole entire life for or how do how do we decide that? Yeah, I mean I would challenge that idea that you have to stick with that specialty area. Uh, I would say it's a good starting place. Like start with the kind of clients that you really enjoy. Which clients inside when they come in and you're like oh yes I got a referral for that. Start with that. Uh, also, you want to look at your community. What's lacking? You know, talk to other therapists. You know, are there uh, other people in your town that are doing, say, Gottman Level 1 marriage counseling? Uh, are there people that are serving teen girls that are cutting? Are there people that are serving uh, different people with acupuncture? And there's also going to be gaps in there. So if there's something you like and there's also gaps, you're going to then help people refer to you because they're going to be excited you're there. I mean, imagine if you're a typical therapist 
and you don't serve teen girls that deal with eating issues or cutting. And then you find out there's this amazing new therapist that came in town. They're highly trained. That's all they want to do all day long. You're going to be thrilled to refer to that person. It's also going to make you look really good because you then are able to refer to a really quality counselor. And so you want to look for those people that are going to be thrilled with the fact that you have that specialty. How do you find the people to refer to you then? So let's say I pick an amazing niche and I'm like, okay, I'm sticking the flag in the sand and this is where I'm at now. What? Yeah. A couple of things that you'd want to do is I would just start looking at something like psychology today and see what therapists are out there that really are generalists. Uh, and so they probably could improve <laughs> a lot of things, but they should uh, be to listening re- to this. Yeah. Okay. They should be listening to the eventual millionaire. Uh, <laughs> But I I would start with doing some of that kind of old fashioned, just reaching out and saying, hey, can I bring a kombucha or a coffee over to your office and meet you Uh, as well? What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to look at what are some blog posts that can help me stand out, Uh, do some basic keyword research. Even if you just go on Google Trends and look and see if people are using the word therapy or the word counseling in your area more, Uh, go on to Google and just start typing in marriage counseling and then see what pops up. Those are going to be some really kind of basic blog posts that you can do. And then when you start to get some traction around that, that's when you can start looking at how do you multiply your time to really start scaling. So what, let's talk about scaling because I love that part yeah. too. So once, so um, especially for like for a client of mine that they have an amazing practice, they actually have some people underneath them, but opened a new office and they're now like, ah, now we need to do the marketing and we have the, you know, there's so many more facets to it. So what is, tell me about scaling and what options you give for that. Yeah. So from the zero to about 50K mark, we're still in the startup phase. When we're at that 50K to about 100K, we're in the growth phase. And then above that, that's scaling. So when you're in that 50K to 100K, uh, you're going to start to ask yourself, how do I start to remove some of these hats? Because when you first get started, your biggest asset is time. Uh, And so you're going to do probably some of your own accounting. You're going to be looking for cheap ways to do a website. You're going to keep your costs and your risk down. Whereas then when you start to grow, you want to say, well, should I be doing my own marketing? So that could be a local marketing firm. It could be, you know, finding someone that specializes in therapist marketing, uh, really looking at, well, how do I start to take hats off? Uh, And then when we look beyond that, we want to really start saying, what is the single best use of my time? Uh, It's unique for therapists. They're not like your typical business people where their hourly rate is so much higher than almost anything else they can pay for. So usually if you do one more counseling session, you can pay for a virtual assistant to do 10 extra hours. Uh, And finding these people online is gonna allow you to then be able to scale and put your time into the actual growth of the business and the scaling of the business rather than just kind of keeping everything going. So how do you prioritize that though? Because if you're like, okay, well, I need marketing help, but do I hire a marketing agency? Do I hire a VA and try and train them? Like, how do you figure out what yeah. goes where? I love how you dive into like the details. What are the details here, Joe? <laughs> Tell me uh, yeah. So the I would say the first thing that most people need to do at that at that growth phase is they need to stop answering the phone and scheduling themselves. Most therapists at that phase are still answering the phone and doing their own scheduling. Think about it, if you call the doctor and he or she answered the phone did the scheduling, told you about the insurance benefits. At first you'd be like, that's great customer service. But then at a certain point you say, that's kind of weird. Like, why are they doing all of this? Um, so adding those levels of professionalism would be the first step. Uh, and that's going to take tons of time off of you uh, as well. It's going to be a multiplier. Almost every time that you hire an assistant to answer phones and schedule, if you're in that hour session and you really think through, okay, if I miss one client, if I'm charging a hundred bucks a session and they come an average of 12 times, that's $1,200 that you missed on that phone call. So paying someone 15 bucks an hour to answer your phone, uh, it, it's going to be a multiplier, not an expense. So then after that, I would look at any of your digital side of things that you really don't enjoy doing. So that's going to be your website, your finances, bookkeeping. Uh, when, when you buy something, where does that receipt go? If you're still entering things into QuickBooks uh, and that's not automated, we want to really look at that. And then after that, I'd say we, if you're billing insurance, uh, you really want to look at how do you outsource that billing? If you're doing your own billing, you really should have a biller at that level. A good biller is only going to charge about 5% of collected claims. So it's not even going to be an upfront cost. And, and for me, uh, to be able to have a biller is really going to take that off of your plate. You didn't go into counseling or into therapy to be a biller. So take those things off your plate. And then if you've done all of that and you're starting to scale, uh, I would really say that you want to start adding clinicians that complement your specialty so that you can be making money when you're not in the office. Okay. So I love it because this is so pertinent for other businesses that are service type also. So it's not just, oh, we have to be a therapist in order for all this. And so that's what I love because you break it down super simply. 
because there was the time that they have to spend on anything is so clear. Whereas a business owner that's like, oh, I'm doing all the stuff. It's not nearly as clear. So you're like, nah, totally makes sense. When we do want to add somebody else though, uh, especially if it's another clinician, how do you, what do you suggest first? Do they go for somebody who's a little more green that you get to mentor that that sort of thing, they're cheaper, or are you trying to find somebody to really expand your practice areas? What, how do you decide on yeah, the first things you really want to look at is uh, first in your state, is it more W-2 friendly or 1099 friendly? So talking to a good employment attorney locally is really important because there's states like California that it's basically impossible to have a 1099. And there's other states that they're super friendly to 1099s. Uh, the other question you want to ask yourself is how much control do I want? Do I want this to be a group practice where I can tell people kind of what to wear, what filing to do, what therapeutic methods, or do I want it to feel like they're just a colleague, almost like renting a space from me? And so that's going to help you decide, am I more on the W-2 side or the 1099 side? Um, next, then you want to also look at, am I just going to pay an hourly rate to these people or do they get a percentage of what they bring in? Uh, the percentage side makes it that you have kind of less upfront risk, but then also uh, your ability to scale and make more uh, kind of changes. Because if you're just paying someone 40 bucks an hour, if you raise their rates to $150 an hour, then your gross revenue and your net revenue definitely go up. Um, so those are all factors you, before you ever start hiring someone, you want to ask yourself those things. So once you land on W-2 versus 1099, you look at your compensation model, then you want to start saying, well, what are the kind of people that I'm already getting calls for, but turning away? So if I'm, say, a marriage counselor, that's all I do. I just help people with their relationships. Uh, maybe I want to have a play therapist uh, for, for kids that are going through things. Maybe there's people that, you know, it doesn't work out with marriage and they get divorced. And so I help men and women that are in transition. So then I'm going to look for people that they want to come on uh, and that complement my specialty. And when you're doing that, um, there's some times that you want to have people that are brand new uh, that it really makes sense. And so that's where uh, if you want to keep your costs down, you don't want to you know, be pay having people uh, be able to pay too much. Uh, you'd probably want to have someone that's more in a limited license capacity. Uh, whereas if you want to be able to continue to raise your rates, then you can you can mentor them. I would say that in general, someone that's fresh out of grad school is harder to market and also doesn't have the connections in town. I would much rather have somebody go out and work at a nonprofit for 20 bucks an hour for a year and get paid to network uh, and then come back to me, show me that you can really put in some time and get to know some people, sit on some committee, some committees locally. So then you come back and you actually bring some value to the practice. I love this because you've said this before. I can tell it's amazing because you you go down. You're very logical in in going. Oh well, when the calls come in, just decipher which one's going to be the logical next step, which is easier to say and harder to do for yourself, right? Because I'm assuming that the people that are getting the phone calls aren't recording all the ones that they're not taking, right? They're like, oh yeah. I should do play Actually, therapy. I would say that would be a system you want in place for your yes. virtual assistant. And so every month, so for example, I have a private pay group practice and I see only one or two clients a week now do mostly the consulting work. Uh, but I have her track how many were insurance that we turned away, how many had insurance and decided to come. Uh, what are the main issues that we're turning people away from? So then each month I get a dashboard report of Okay, we turned away five people that they wanted specifically a play therapist. Okay, we don't have a play therapy room. I don't necessarily want to turn one of our rooms into a play therapy room, but could we have a mobile play therapist or a part-time play therapist? I'll then start thinking about that and I may or may not land on it, but at least then I have the data to help inform the business decisions I'm going to make. See, I love this, especially because the, the, you want the therapist to be able to do in their highest calling, right? And most likely the billing and the calls and all that stuff is just extra chaos that's added. And that sort of actually goes into um, what you do, your slow down school stuff. So I want to talk about this because you are adamant and I adore how adamant you are about slowing down and how big of a deal that is. So tell us a little bit about what slow down school is. Yeah. So slow down school, it actually came out of an idea when my wife and I were in the Detroit airport headed to a conference I was speaking at and she got really into the adult coloring books and she was doing one in the airport and I said to her, like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if there was like a conference where people like played with Play-Doh and they like colored? And she's like, that would be. And we just started like kind of riffing off each other and just had this hilarious conversation of picturing a bunch of therapists playing to come and like just slow down. And then in typical Joe and Christina form, she took a nap on the way to Asheville, North Carolina. And I like sketched out the entire conference. And as soon as we landed, I bought slowdownschool.com and had this like idea. 
Uh, and so the basic premise of it is that we do our best work when we allow our brains to rest. You know, you think about when your big ideas come, it's usually when, you know, you're taking a shower or you're on a long drive and you just turn the radio off and you're not thinking about anything. And it's like, oh, wait, you have these breakthrough moments that happen. Uh, and this is typical throughout kind of business that this happens. But how often do we go to a conference and, you know, travel was terrible. You know, American Airlines canceled our flight. And it's just like over and over these things happen. And then we're supposed to concentrate and work on our business. So we kind of flipped it where the first two days of slowdown school, we genuinely slow down. We encourage people to turn their phones off, uh, take their phones and put them in these little envelopes called Zenvelopes that a friend of mine invented and zip them up. Uh, we sit on the beach, we go for hikes. Uh, we had a silent disco, uh, brought in a DJ that just killed it. Uh, we did improv on the beach this year, uh, which improv with therapists, I thought it would be a flop and it was hilarious. <laughs> so, so we now have like, you know, two days that we've all connected with each other, bonded with each other, just got to know each other as people. And then for two and a half days, we just run full tilt towards their business. And the ideas that people have when we do these sprints, and I know you're a tech person, Jamie, uh, is we'll do these 20 minute sprints where people say, what am I going to achieve in these 20 minutes? How am I going to get it done? What am I going to work on? What tools do I need? Now let's go. Like, for example, this one lady, she had an idea of a consulting business. In 20 minutes, she sketched out the entire consulting business, her unique selling point. She named the business, bought the URL, and everyone was like, that totally fits you in 20 minutes. Most people will spend months figuring out what they're going to name their business. But because they slowed down first, it's like these doors just open up and people have just great ideas on how to grow their big idea and how to grow their practice. See, I don't think this is really... Um... I was going to say hinted on, but not even hint, not even hinted on because the creative side of being a business owner gets thrown by the wayside, right? So like for me, and we buy, um, for all clients, we buy uh, shower notepads because no offense, but every, like the shower is the very best way or I paint and I didn't realize that painting to me actually is working on my business because wait, I listen wait, to like music. Wait, painting nothing. walls or painting, painting like painting? paintings. Me yeah. too. Oh, what, do really? you, what do you like to paint oh, with? I, I, acrylic. We're gonna me show. Too. Really? I hate oil. To me, oil we just takes friends. so long. I know. I How do I not know this? <laughs> yeah, I I just started painting again too because I found it's one of the few activities where I can just be totally mindful. Yeah. So so what do you do? Okay. So tell me. So let's unpack that a little bit because you're yeah. a guy that has a thing called slow down school, right? And your wife is the one coloring, and you're the one coming up with all the ideas on the plane, right? So what do you what are you doing, and what are you using the creative side for? Yeah. So for me, I have to have very clear boundaries of what I can and can't do. Otherwise, I'll think about all these fun ideas. Like I literally every day I'm like, I can't believe this is my job and I make money doing this because it's so fun and such a creative release to say, what if we launched this to help therapists? What if we did that? I could probably think about this night and day. So I need for myself to set very clear boundaries. And so that looked like a couple summers ago doing an experiment where I started taking Fridays off. I'm really big on experiments versus kind of pass fail mentality. And so I packed it all into four days a week. And then that fall kept that going because it worked really well and the income kept going up. And then the next summer I started taking Mondays off. And so now for a year and a half or so, uh, we've I've been taking, you know, four day weekends every weekend. So that clear boundary of what does a three day work week look like and what does it look to be multi six figures every single year uh, and growing at you know, a certain you know percent every year. Those are the boundaries that I want to do because I could work every day. Now I do a little bit of emails on Monday and Friday, probably 15 minutes, but then I have to set up systems that create it so that the business keeps moving. So I have a director of details that goes into my email. She texts me if something crazy happens that I need to address right away. Um, I set it up so that I attract people that understand that I work three days a week. And so they're not going to text me on a Sunday and be like, when's our consulting meeting? What are we doing? No, they're going to email Emily and say, uh, sorry, I lost the calendar. The calendar invite got deleted, whatever. I then attract people that fit that, that mentality of slowing down so that we can spark massive innovation. And you call them cool names, like the director of details. That sounds awesome. I, I, oh, I totally stole that from Grant Baldwin. I got to give him credit for that title because uh, that's just such a good title. <laughs> Did it, it was a grant that did it. That's hilarious. Grant was a client of mine a long time ago. Too. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was I was on his uh, podcast a while back and talking about how to use speaking to grow your coaching. 
Uh, and he, his director of details was emailing me and I'm like, can I steal that? And I think they said that they stole it from somebody else, but I'm like, that's a good name. That's a ridiculous name. Well, I bow down yeah. to Grant on that one then too, because I totally noticed. But, that, but the whole point too is having somebody that does all that stuff. So now your weekends are... <laughs> Are longer than your work weeks. Yeah, which is my wife impressive. goes. You know, my wife said, you know, Labor Day, Memorial Day. Like, why does it always fall on a Monday? You don't. You always take Mondays off. It's not an extra day for us. I'm like, but Christina, we get four day weekends. Come on. I know. Oh, poor baby. I know. Right. Yeah. Everyone feels bad for you right now. That's just right. They're like, you suck, man. But the whole point is that you're building up the systems. And I know your systems are freaking fantastic. So once you go in, you go all in and commit. How do you give us some tips on creating? systems, especially for somebody who's in the chaos of trying to do a lot of it themselves. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I love um, the book, The One Thing and just saying, what's the one thing that's going to make everything else easier? I'm laughing uh, you know, I, I know... literally interviewed Jay right before I interviewed you. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Jay and I, I think we, we texted you a picture when we were at TEDx <laughs> yes. together. Uh, so I get to hang out with Jay for a few days uh, when they were up here in Traverse and John Vroman, all these people yes. that like we both know. It's so funny, um, though. I totally forgot that you sent me that picture until just now when you said his name and he was 20 minutes before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, so that book, I mean, it can't it doesn't just apply to business. It also can apply to your life or other things like what's the one thing that's going to just make things easier. Um, so even in our own life, our daughter's bedroom was just always chaos. And it doesn't make us feel like, OK, now it's a good bedtime. You're going to sleep in like, you know, all this books and crud. So we created a system for it where here's the little container. You can keep whatever you want in the container. The books always need to be put away. All of your little buddies. I mean, this is a four and seven year old. Like They got to have a pretty simple system your little buddy's got to be on your bed every night and there can be nothing on the floor. So they then take less into their into their area because they now have a system. And so if we start with, okay, what's the thing that's just kind of pissing me off? Like what, what would make everything easier? If someone checked my email, I hate looking at 200 emails when I come back from vacation. I hate looking at all these things. Have somebody check your emails, figure out the systems for that, observe what you're doing and then teach someone else to do it. See, I love the way that you do it though too. And I highly recommend people going, on vacation or taking Fridays off or whatever it is, because the amount of time that we think we're working as an entrepreneur versus the amount of time that we can actually compress into a certain amount of time, it's insane when you actually just put constraints around what you're doing. How did how did that work for you? Were you like, I'm going to take Fridays off, that worked well. Now I'm going to take Mondays off. Did you have to redo all your systems or was it super easy to do? No, I just looked ahead a couple months and started blocking it off uh, mm -hmm. and then just put it on repeat that it was blocked off. Uh, it's amazing. Like, you know, I had half an hour between two mastermind groups today and one of the other consultants that works with Practice the Practice, she had this new idea around something and wanted to talk about it. And I texted her earlier, like, I have half an hour starting at 1.30. She called me right at 1.30. Uh, the mastermind went over by a minute. And so I then called her back. But then I, you know, something happened in the mastermind where I had to text somebody else. That half hour wasn't dinking around, checking email. That was getting things done that are going to help my bottom line. And so those three days are full all-out sprints. But I think that it's natural to say, okay, I can run full tilt from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. three days in a row, knowing I'm going to have a four-day weekend. And I'm going to go home in, you know, a few minutes and then go, hang out with my daughters and my wife. I love that it's also not like a 12 hour day or like nine to four. I mean, just <laughs> right. to it's nine to four. <laughs> yeah. I want to drop off my daughter at school, daughters at school every day. Uh, I want to be home at four, you know, to help with dinner. And there's going to be times that there's flexibility because I think your original question of, you know, how do you structure it for yourself? I need to have some basic kind of regulations for myself. And then I can always say, okay, I'm going to see somebody at four o'clock because it's a unique opportunity. Or I'm going to meet with someone on Friday because, man, I just can't fit them in for a month on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Uh, I can then have that variability knowing that most of the time I'm going to follow my rules. See, and I appreciate that too. Someone else was asking me not that long ago about how I, I stop at a certain time. I was like, I have children and they have to be picked up from school. And if I yeah. don't, then that's bad. So that's why it works really well for me, right? Whatever those constraints are, if you actually do them, whatever it is. Now I need that. Don't get me wrong. I probably keep working because I love it. Um, but being able to go, oh, I have this. But then I also have the flexibility of being able to do what I want. How do you not be just flexible all the time? Because that's the other piece where you're like, oh, this is my overflow day. And now it became a day of working instead of just the overflow day. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think there's times that I intentionally do that. So, for example, a friend of mine and I are launching a new podcast that's really kind of for fun, exploring some pi positive psychology things and like how to be uh, it's called a capitalist podcast, like capitalist with an H. So happy cap capitalist kind of stuff. 
Uh, so we're, we're brainstorming this. Uh, we don't have a specific launch date, but it's fun, but it's also work. And so if I spend a Friday morning working on that, uh, that's intentional that I'm putting time into that, even though it feels like work. Now, if people aren't doing their own self work where they're saying, well, what's driving my business? Like, is it a fear that all of a sudden I'm not gonna have enough money? Uh, is it some other kind of negative mindset? Well, I need to do my own self work. And that could be listening to podcasts, that could be reading a book, could be going to see a therapist or working with a life coach. In some way, work through your junk uh, so that that's not leading the process. Uh, because if we look back at what's our why of business, that's really like the gasoline or the electric energy of our car that is our, our life. And that's going to move us forward. But that why, if that's not the correct why, we're going to just kind of continue to go in the wrong direction. And so uh, if we can find that navigation, for me, that makes sense to work through my own junk so that that's not going to be the lead. I can say, okay, you helped me in the past. Now sit in the back seat. See, it's so awesome because self-awareness is a wonderful thing. And as a business owner, as you're trying to go through, things come up. And don't get me wrong. I think business is one of the best personal development things humanly possible. But when you when it's unconscious and you don't realize, you don't realize that it's driving you. And you're like, ah, I'm still bumping up against the same thing. And it makes pain not only in your personal life, but it really brings it to the forefront in your business. How do you have that awareness? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I'm just a naturally curious person. And so continually working on, well, what are the things that are hard for me? So for example, shutting my mind off is really hard. And so I've gone the opposite direction of really trying to learn to meditate more. You know, I'm working with a Buddhist therapist that he is my personal therapist. And so, you know, I use my muse to see how my brain waves are. Uh, and I try to meditate and it's always a struggle, but I'm getting better at it. And so like anything, you've got to put in the hard work to make that big step forward. Because I believe if I can let my mind settle more and really live kind of slowing down uh, and genuinely slow down, that's going to make my life better. Well, you were the one that introduced me to the news guy and I use it every day, every single day. Every day? Every oh, day. That's I can show awesome. you my little thing. I show every single day. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think my streak is 40 or something like that. And I keep going 40 days and then I lose it. Like, yeah, I'm so close. Oh, I know. well, it's like I, my daughter, my seven-year-old, um, she she has a big personality. She's very strong and brave. Um, and, you know, she also, that can be very difficult at times. And I want her to stay on that trajectory because I think we need more strong, bold women. Um, but as a parent, I also need to help her like chill out sometimes. Yeah. And so she started doing the muse. Um, and it's amazing because almost all of her meditation time is in the neutral or calm zone. So I'm like, when she wants to, she can calm her brain down. Uh, and so she's way, she always gets way more birds than I do. <laughs> Mine too. She thinks that's hilarious. I know. So my, and it, the, so, and for anybody who doesn't know, the muse is a, is a meditation headband that actually tracks your brain waves, which is amazing. So yeah, yay. it's the first medical grade EEG. You know, it's EEG. <laughs> so, so, what's, so I'm a little biohacker lady. So you get the other app where you can actually see all the brainway. Have you done all that stuff? I haven't. Okay, I know that they, at, the, at their world headquarters, they connected it to a beer keg so they can pour beer with their mind. <laughs> okay, wait, I need to learn that. Now. I don't drink beer, but I'm sure I can figure something for that. See, but, and so to me though, being able to show that to the kids, I show it to my clients. I show it when we do retreats. Um, but for the kids, they're, they're better than like my son will meditate. He doesn't need um, the muse because he's, I don't know, more zen. His, his goal this, this summer was to become enlightened. That's what his goal was. It's like, awesome. That is awesome. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> but he's meditating every day. But my daughter is very similar to what you said. And so being able to go, ooh, not only can I see my, not faults, but my work on work in progress type things, but we can help our kids do it even more. And it's probably a lot easier to see it. Ourselves. Well, and I think it's such a great example to our kids to show that we're constantly developing. I feel like previous generations of parents had kind of a we've got it figured out, just listen to us approach. Um, and what does that show us that like you stop developing when you're an adult? Like, that's not true. We should keep developing. Uh, and, and so even just starting painting, uh, my seven year old was like, hey, I want to paint, too. And so I set up an easel. Um, and so what I did is I just sketched out kind of what I was going to draw, which was a basic landscape. And then I mixed the paint. I'm like, here's what I'm going to use for the sky, but do whatever you want. And so now we have these sort of matching paintings, but it's her own interpretation of it, uh, which how fun is that that now we have these paintings? But it was really I just wanted to calm my brain down and go do something that you know was better than like straightening up the house. <laughs> Right? It's hilarious that you say that. I told me and my daughter are planning on painting tonight. Somebody 
Uh, I sold my first painting to New Zealand not that long ago. Nice. Right and the kids are going like, you just, just painted something and then sold it online? I'm like, I did. Didn't really know how, but it was great. <laughs> So now they're like, ooh, what can we make to, to sell online, <laughs> right? But it's, but it's amazing for them to see the creativity behind it instead of the, I have everything figured out. I know everything I'm doing. I mess up everything. And, the, and for them to be able to see, that's amazing. And for me to remember that I am allowed to mess up stuff, right? Or that yeah. whole piece, the permission side of things, that's where, to me, tapping into the creative side gives me so much of a breath of release, relief instead of the business owner, this is what we did, right? And so totally. having those two sides, do you think everybody needs something like that? Yeah. I mean, I think that when I, and I can't say what everybody needs, they may have different needs, but when we set up something that's outside of our business. So even this weekend, I put up this big shelf thing in the garage that was such a pain and measuring, I got covered in drywall dust, but like, I was not going to let this stupid hanging shelf thing beat me. <laughs> so some of my like competitiveness came out, but it was it was physical. It was mental. I had to measure like a carpenter and I'm not really one of those kind of carpenter type guys. But we, I think we do need those things that give us a true respite away from our business. Um, but then I think there's also overlap where our business and family can interact. So, for example, Lucia, my seven year old, she wanted to do a lemonade stand and we started brainstorming. Well, how much money do you want to make from this? And so instead she did Lucia's homemade lemonade and we made simple syrup and we squeezed all the le lemons ourselves. She had frozen strawberries and basil and then also served coffee and did it right outside of a marathon that was going on. And she she made like one hundred and twenty dollars an hour for three hours. It was just like crazy. We no, no, that's wrong. She made one hundred and twenty dollars over three hours. So 40 bucks an hour. Still, yeah. But like and that's after she paid us back for all of the supplies, you know, and she actually like hired some kids to work it when she didn't want to work it anymore and paid them like a dollar an hour. So like we can transfer these skills and have it be fun for our kids, too, without it feeling like we're just kind of pushing our business skills down their throats, too. Can you, can you imagine being that age? And I mean, I had lemonade sales, but not, I mean, I think I made like $2 over three hours, maybe, right? And it was yeah. sad at the end going, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, when people were like, wait, I can have basil and frozen strawberries in my lemonade and you handmade the simple syrup as a seven-year-old with your dad? What? I mean, she charged $2 a glass and people were like, I can give you more. This is worth more than that. And she was like, wait, what? <laughs> See, that's yeah. why we do what we do too. That's why you have four days off on the weekend. So you can actually be there for your kiddos too. And totally. that's what really, really matters. I know I have to start wrapping up because I have to go pick up my children. I think, and and, and you today's my daughter's birthday and I got to go to a birthday party. So <laughs> yeah. and you did this? Wow. Okay, then we should go. But I have to ask the last question I always ask. Okay. What's one action listeners can do this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Yeah. So I briefly touched on it when I was talking about taking Fridays off of having an experimenting men mentality. So often people that go to college or grad school or you, you, whatever your phase is, they think about things in a pass fail mentality. I write this paper, I turn it in, I get a grade. And that's just not how the business world is. It's all about experiments. So it's slow down school, which I put so much effort into launching and then only sold two tickets. And then I started working with you and you helped me sell way more. Um, I saw, I got a lot of information about how people don't buy things in the private practice market. They don't just buy things straight up from a podcast. So if we can have an experimenting mindset when we launch something new, when we're doing something that allows us to always be gathering information rather than have that pass fail mindset. So I would say do some sort of experiment that's going to move you towards the life that you want. And I know that by slowing down, you're going to spark so much creativity that you're going to continue to level up. I, I wholly appreciate that. I think everyone needs to actually do that. Not just think about, oh, that's great. I should paint. I should test something. Awesome. But actually right now, take some time. Turn off this podcast right now. No, not right now. Wait till until he's done. <laughs> and then really think of one thing to test. And it can be short. It doesn't have to be long at all, but one thing. So that way we don't feel bad if we don't, if we don't accomplish, right? We, I'm, I am of the mindset of I'm really good at being mean to myself. Why don't we be nice and just test and have fun and actually enjoy the lives that we have? So where do we find out more about your site, about Slow Down School, about Next Level Practice, all that fun stuff? Yeah. So practiceofthepractice.com is our main site. So we're giving away over 30 different tools to your audience. So if they go to practiceofthepractice.com forward slash EM, 
Uh, so often people just have their one giveaway and everyone's at a different phase. So we have five different eBooks we're giving away to your audience. We have all these checklists for different phases of practice. You can find us on iTunes. Uh, you can go to slowdownschool.com. Uh, our next level practice is for people that are starting a practice and want to be in community. You can request an invite over at practiceofthepractice.com forward slash invite for that. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, Happy Jamie. birthday to your daughter too. Thanks. This is so awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Heck yeah. Anytime. Come back again. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to check out more amazing resources, I'm only curating the best of the best. Go check out eventualmillionaire.com. You can take the Eventual Millionaire quiz, figure out where you are in business and what you need right now. Plus, you can look at curated resources specifically for you on the new Start Here page. I'm so excited. Please join us. Please let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here for you. And have a fantastic day. Bye.